Good evening, everybody. My name is Francesca Lamorgia. I'm the founder and director of Mother Tongues. And the person who first thought that doing a festival like this would be a good idea. I have to thank a lot of people in this room uh, for believing in this project and being here tonight as well. Um, so I officially welcome you all to the sixth edition of the Mother Tongues Festival. Every year we work behind the scenes uh, for what seems like a four-day festival, a three-day festival, but there's a lot of conversations that happen, there's a lot of um, collaborations and a lot of very important uh, steps that we make to bring multilingualism to in front of the eyes of people who may not have thought about it before. So we have an artistic mission, but we also have a social mission and we want to make languages and the, all the languages that people speak in their homes more visible and more visible also from an auditory point of view. So this is a moment for all of us to gather and reflect on what it means to be on an island where more than 100 languages are spoken and they're spoken by small babies, they're sm spoken by adults and it's a multilingual island where multilingualism is written in the constitution as well. Uh, the theme of this year's festival is building community through creative multilingualism. So myself and Ifa Kunkanen is here, I've spoken a lot about the right wording and Ifa was rightly really insisting on the word building because there's a lot of work we need to do to actually raise awareness of multilingualism, raise awareness of why we do the work that we do and there's a lot of building that we need to continue doing. There's a lot of conversations we need to have. There's a lot of change we still want to see that we haven't seen happening yet. And also we wanted to have the word community in it because only when we come together, we can actually share who we are and what we have in common, but also the differences that there are between ourselves. And obviously creative multilingualism, you'll hear all about it over the next few hours and also in the coming days. So do have a look at our festival program and also the previous and the future ones because we're going to be building on creative multilingualism. So we've seen over the years that when children and their families, we primarily work with young people, when they're free to express themselves in all of their languages, whether that is in preschool or in school or in the local library, something really special happens. You see it in the children's eyes when they hear their language spoken by one of the teachers, they, their eyes just start to look different. Even they, they start to look around and go, what's going on? And they're really changing. You know, they change in front of our eyes. We've seen it even with the preschoolers. So we know that the work we do, especially with schools, with preschools, is very, very important because children need to see their languages, they need to hear their languages in the world that they live in, that is not only in their house. The world they live in is everywhere. It's the Lewis Tutala, it's the local square, it's the library, it's everywhere we live. So this is also be, transform be transformational, not only for the children, but for the parents as well because the parents also gain confidence when they come to say, for example, our language explorers workshops. And some of these you'll be able to witness if you want to be a child this weekend, there's plenty of workshops. Um, and what the parents do when they come is that they feel relaxed in using their own language in a space where everybody's free to use whatever language they want, including English, including Irish, including not speaking at all. It's all absolutely fine. But in that moment, the parents know that they can use whatever language feels comfortable to them. And no one is judging them, no one is othering them in that moment. And that's slightly different from what happens outside of that space. So we would like those emotions and those special moments to be also extended beyond the individual session, beyond the festival. We would like the change to be more of a societal change, but we'll get there slowly. So, um, I, I've, I wrote notes, but then I decided not to read them, so that's no use. Um, <laughs> but uh, also what I think is, what I really wanted to touch on is the importance of us building community, especially through the festival. Because the festival is a moment, but as I said, it's a moment that lasts a year. <laughs> so it's a lot of conversations and it's a lot of collaborations with all sorts of bodies, from speaking to Tuzla, uh, to local authorities, to local libraries, to preschools, 
we really want and we really believe in working collaboratively. And that's why I'm really happy that the panel we're having tonight uh, brings in people from different uh, cultural, as in academic backgrounds, with different kinds of knowledge, but we're all working together towards the same goal. We're all in favor of promoting community building through multilingualism. And we, we know that there's a lot of a way to go, but we know that only through real collaboration we'll be able to get there. So um, the last thing I want to say, because I don't want to take too much time, is that um, on tonight's event, we're not only hosting a panel, we're also uh, launching our festival program, which you'll be able to see on your desk, but also on our website, mothertonguesfestival.com. And we're launching our Spotlight publication, which you can see here. The title is, as I said earlier, Reflections on Making Multilingual Art Work. And we have, uh, for the first time, we have gathered experiences that are truly multilingual, transformational, like I described earlier, from Ireland and also outside of Ireland. And the contributors to this booklet are Yaron Matras from Multilingual Manchester, Mark McLaughlin from Branner, Esther Rizzi from Tira Fuori La Lingua, Segzi Ninchel from Music for Words, Michael Walling from Border Crossing, Nisha Tanden, who is here next to me, from Artsetska, and Kathy McAvoy from LYACS. So this is a something small that you can put in your pocket to remind yourself that making multilingual art is possible. It changes lives, and that's what we're trying to promote together. So I would like to welcome you all to tonight's discussion. It will be very interactive, so drink water. There will be a lot of interesting conversations. And I would like to leave the floor to Anka Minesco, who is going to introduce all of you. Is that OK? OK, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, let's applaud Francesca. <laughs> I know we're live and I'm not meant to forget, but I forgot because I didn't read the notes. But I had a whole page of thank yous. Mm, Excuse okay, me. Then. Excuse me. That. Then I'm going to shut up. Um, well, our team Elena Cristofanon, Ifa Concanon, Celine Bogmark, Gatte, Soraya Sobrevia, Tatiana Santos, and Nora Luagi. Ta da! And also, I, um, I want to say that we're very grateful to our funders, the Arts Council and South Dublin County Council, because without their support, this would have been a dream, but it wouldn't have been a reality. So thank you. Thank you. OK, so it's up to us. And um, I'm very honored to sit here surrounded by fabulous minds and artists and non-artists. I'm not an artist, so uh, just putting it out there, you have to teach me. Um, uh, I am Anka Minescu, I will start by saying that. I am a lecturer in psychology at the University of Limerick. I'm originally Romanian, I lived in the Netherlands and I've been in Ireland for the last 12 years. And I speak a few languages myself, but the one I would really, really like to speak to my kids is Romanian. But that's also the language that they are not very proud of and not, not very happy to, to speak in public. So when I learned about mother tongues and when I learned about the festival, I thought, oh, yes, a collective, collaborative, you know, I think it's relatively nationwide uh, initiative that can actually make my kids one day proud that, um, that they come from a family that uh, doesn't speak Irish at home or English at home, but they could speak Romanian at home. Um, but anyway, today uh, we are going to hear from different people doing different things, uh, and, and we don't have a set plan, but we do have the plan of letting everybody introduce themselves, because the idea is that a lot of the things that we do, um, we do because of who we are, right? So then, you know, if, if you introduce yourself, you're kind of also giving an insight into why you do the things you do and how you do the things you do. And it is my great pleasure to be surrounded by Owen, by Hala, by Anna and Nisha. And um, I will pass on uh, the microphone to Hala, who actually told me to introduce myself in Romanian. Hmm, and I forgot. I didn't have my notes either. Okay, so, um, Buonasera. Uh, mă bucur că sunt aici. 
Hey, good evening, buonasera. I'm happy to be here. Hala. Merhaba. Ana ismi Hala. Um, ana musiqiya wa ana min Palestine. So hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hala. I am a community musician and uh, a researcher uh, in the area of um, community music and best practices when working with uh, migrant communities, especially refugees and asylum seekers who came to Ireland in the context of post-conflict. Okay for now. Or That's now. okay for now, yes. <laughs> Owen? I'm uh, Arisha, I'm Emmanuel Carey. Um, a moniker uh, Ondi Bardoon. My name is Ondi Bardoon. Um, I am a traveller. I work as the creator and national collection officer of the National Museum of Ireland. Um, I'm a writer and a creator, and I'm very involved in revival around our stories, our lore, as well as uh, practical expressions who we are, including very more importantly, our language. Thank you, Owen. And you're also really funny. <laughs> so I'm sure that will be that will be the next thing. Um, Anna. Tronon Jessica of Anna Nigal her time terms are Agassas Island are more going to in Alme. My name is um, uh, Anna Nigal her and I'm originally from Ardmore Island in County Donegal and I now have been living in uh, the Dublin area for the last 28 years. I lived in France for six years before that. Um, and I I retired um, <coughs> associate professor from Maynooth University where I was in charge of the language centre where we taught 11 languages for um, many years and then I became um, head of the Centre for Irish Language Research, Teaching and Testing and head of the School of Celtic Studies. I retired two years ago and I, um, so for, since 2012, I was chair of the board of Udras na which is the state agency responsible for the economic, social cultural and linguistic development of the Gaeltha. And I finished my second two-year term there in uh, on the 15th of January of this year. And on the 26th, I think it was, of November, I was appointed chair of TG Care, the um, television station. And I'm I also sit on the board of the uh, board of trustees of the Association of Language Testers in Europe, ALTI. Um, and um, <laughs> <laughs> she's a busy woman, this one. So, yeah. So, uh, I've, I've sat on committees to do with languages and multilingualism um, uh, in Ireland and in Europe for the last 30 or so years at different times. And you are the native here. Right. I, I'm between the native. you and Owen, I'm <laughs> between the most the native natives. of the natives yeah. in yeah. Ireland, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, and they speak different languages natives. than two native people yes. here. Yes, so uh, we'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, all the way from Belfast. Shubh Dupahir, my name is Nisha Tandon and I'm from the art sector, which is an arts organization that has been here for the other countries वेलकम करती है तो उसका मैं 40 साल से उसका उद्घाटन किया और उसको चला रही हूँ सो इन इंग्लिश आई मीन आई कुड स्पीक इन थ्री फोर मोर लैंग्वेजेस बट इन इंग्लिश इन अ सिंपल वेरी सिंपल लैंग्वेज माय नेम इज नीश टांडन एंड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी माय नेम इज नीश टांडन एंड � which helps the minority ethnic people coming in our beautiful island to give them their personal development and develop them in their culture and arts and languages skill. Recently, we have been working quite a lot with the refugee and asylum seekers. And, in, and this has been a 40 years of living in Northern Ireland, a very divided uh, country. Um, and we sort of try to bring everybody together and the slogan of art sector is cultural bonding through arts. And that's what we do. Um, and we run lots of festivals and lots of, and bring everybody, uh, give them their place, which is very important. And in my organization, we speak about 42 different languages and every language gets its room and space to grow and um, you know, just give them that sense of belonging. And that is very, very important, and that's what we do. Wow. <laughs> so, as you can see, um, people around this table are working with different groups as well, and they are representing different 
maybe types of activities and types of interacting with both arts and languages. But I, I suppose what everybody really has in common is that all of this work is, like Francesca was saying, col is collaborative. Because you, you cannot work with communities without collaborating with the communities. And, and I think there is also, and I think in this room, in a way, I'm talking to the converted, right? Uh, that uh, when you talk about collaboration, the true meaning of collaboration is also co-creation. Uh, because otherwise, it's just colonialism. And we don't want to mention that C word you know, anywhere, because it comes with a lot of problems. So rather than people coming and imposing something from the top or from a disciplinary perspective or from some sort of, a, you know, place of expertise, I think all of these people are working with uh, trying to see, first of all, who's living in Ireland, how are they represented in the policies, in the, in the school curricula. We were talking to Anna about her work with um, with basically language policy in general. What can you do at the Living Cert, for example, things like this. So maybe my next question is, how do you work with the communities? Is it easy? Is it hard? Because the idea of co-creation sometimes is really nice and kind of almost sexy. Can I say that on camera? Yeah. Um, but yeah, because it's nice. You, you know, you bring people together and there's a nice vibe. You know, it's like coming to a party, but you might not get what you want out of it or you might not you know, come on the same page, or people might start dropping out, or you might not get the same buyout, or you end up, you bring some people together, but by bringing them people together, you're creating further divisions, right? Mm -hmm. So because you're bringing only the Muslims today and the Palestinians tomorrow, and okay, that is actually a different thing I learned, <laughs> because there are Palestinian people who are not Muslim here in the room. Yeah. So that so yeah so okay so my question to the panel now is how do you work with the communities how do you engage in this kind of maybe co-creation and I will start again with Hala not because I want to go in this uh, rhythm again because our heads will go but but uh, I just start with Hala because Hala is a community musician mm -hmm. and that is something that in Romania I never heard of but in in the University of Limerick we're really proud of and you are one of those uh, yeah. people we're very proud of yeah. so. Just before I answer that really hard question, do you guys know what a community musician is? Have you heard that word before? No. No, yeah. See, so, I'm not the only one, so no. you better explain. Yeah. So, um, you, you all know what music education is? Yes. Yeah? No? When you get in a music teacher and they go, you have to learn this, this is the way, this is the thing. And no, you, you don't sound nice, so you don't sing. You've got that experience. So, there's another side of making music that I am 100% you all experienced it in the pub in Ireland when you're all just sitting down and you know a session goes on and you're singing and with them uh, when you're singing in your family um, that's also community musician um, so community music is there are different types of it but it's basically the music of the community so I don't I do have a, a degree in music education but in my work as a music community musician is I work with the people to create music that's what they like at this moment. You know, what we want to represent. We can do songwriting, uh, we can share music from our cultures, we can play instruments if someone plays an instrument, but there is a social emphasis on the music making rather than, oh, we need to learn this curriculum and we need to have a product and an excellent performance. We can perform and the performance can be excellent, but that's not the focus of the work. There's more a sense of a social uh, approach. So that's basically the nuts and shells of community musician. And we work in different different contexts. My work with refugees and the word how do we do what we do is a very big question. <laughs> and it's, you have two minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, it's not an easy thing to answer because every community you work with have a different needs and a different um, way you need to be flexible enough to work with them and just in terms of languages well I, I speak multiple languages as well so that helped me because mm -hmm. I, I speak English French and Arabic and Irish sign language which can be forgotten sometimes um, so that helped me a lot communicate however um, in my work I try to make the focus on the music we're making and I try if, if I'm working with people who don't speak Arabic, then I'll bring an Arab song and start there. So everybody can start with a language that they never spoken before. So no one has an advantage. 
and then, or if no one speaks French, I'll try and go bring a French song, or, you know, and then start from a plain level field. Um, and then shift the focus on it being on the music making, on the fun, on like, um, you know, sharing that create instead of focusing on what we can't understand with each other in the language. And it's very funny. I find language funny for a couple of reasons, because there's so many layers in the language. Um, I met a Syrian family, for example, who created their own language by adding a letter every other letter. And it's only <laughs> them they understand it. And I'm like, what's going on there? There's another thing where, as an Arab, I would use words that as a Syrian who speaks also Arabic, they don't use that word mm -hmm. or they use it in a different way where I had someone come and say, Hala, don't say that again. And I'm like, why? It's like, it does not mean what you think it means. In Syria, we use it differently. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so it is a difficult, so you have to be very flexible and aware and open the dialogue between you and your participants where they, they come to you and say, you're using our language wrong, mm. you know, and then um, as well, the body language is, is very, very important because even if they're not talking to you, their body is talking to you. Are they sitting across because that's kind of the protecting themselves? Are they open to sing with you? Um, you know, what's what's the, what's going on in their face? Because we can't hide our emotion if we're like, you know, going very scrunchy or very open. Uh, or smiling, thank you, because that gives me a bit of comfort. <laughs> so there is multiple levels of the mm. language, but I, how is always different with the group that I work with, but I think the bottom line is to be flexible and accepting of everybody who comes in, yeah. regardless if, if they spoke English, great. If they didn't, there's Google Translate, mm. there's miming, mm. and there's always someone in the middle of that who knows a word or two, and you can find your way around, mm. and then music, when once you do music, then everything's okay. Yeah. She had me sing a lullaby <laughs> one time in one of her workshops. Like, I never sang that lullaby since my kids were small, you know, and, just, <laughs> yeah. and, and then I, to be honest, at that point, I didn't even care if anybody understood or not, because everybody was sharing their lullaby. So mm -hmm. it was just this, this space, you know, that was created. So talking about spaces, I want to move on to Owen, because I, I listened to him a, a few times, and then I bought the book, Why the Moon Travels. Mm -hmm. Oh, my latest bedside table book. Because it's such an interesting thing about the Irish traveler culture, right? Where the, a lot of the, a lot of everything happens in the circle, right? It happens, it happens around the traditional or the token uh, campfire or, or something like this, right? And I, I suppose, you know, this kind of storytelling, singing, sharing in, in the community is something that is in the genes, right? I mean, it's so part of the, of the culture, right? I mean, I, I could go so far and crazy to say that's human history all, yeah. all in all, right? But I think, I wonder, if, if, how do you do it now when you work in a museum? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, um, I, I think that when we, we are all storytellers. I think we forget that we're storytellers. And you're probably a very proficient storytelling over life. Have you ever come down on a Saturday morning and said, Listen, do you know what happened last night? You are naturally a storyteller. And, and when we're talking about museums, but museums in one way or another is a, a, a way that the state is telling a story or a narrative of its history and what it wants to give promise to, and what it wants to have a sense of value, what it wants to ignore, what it wants to say, kind of things you think we're interested in. So places like museums are telling those stories and they are communicating. And to part of my own work was that we were working on the national collection of our um, travellers. When you think about this, like we've always been here, we've always like, been a part of, of, of this island, the history of this island. Um, our understanding of the origins of the Irish people are slightly different than the established. We believe that nomadism is a very natural aspect of, of human reality, that no one can own land, that we are, we're people who are just naturally transient. So when we look at the idea of our history and how we tell our history and who tells our history. The part of that work within the museum is that when I'm recording, I'm allowing people to select the language they want to do and the objects coming in. It's not myself who decides how, it is, uh, how it's classified, how, you know, there's the technical measurements, but actually what, is, what people give about that, that item, that object, that history they're recording is by their own choice and including their own language, which actually was a bit of a difficulty at times because what we're doing is that we're putting into an official record, a language and a recording that we don't even have a Greek script off into a national institution, which is like going, what are they saying? 
you know, <laughs> you know, which brings up the anxiety of people. And actually, that anxiety comes from is the need and the history of controlling it, rather than going, this is someone who's just sharing an aspect of the story. If they are cursed you left, right, and center and blue, that's fine too, because it's clearly it's communication. Um, but I do think that tapping deeper into how we communicate, why we communicate, and the language of our own, our own people, um, because I think what's slightly different for many people and most minority groups, and some of the majority stories have experienced this, including the Irish people with the oppression of Irish and Gaelic on the island itself, is our language went through its own journeys that it came from a very open, flourish language, such as the news in a very crypto form, which means we say it's secret mm. and it's private and it's an eternal practice, which is not entirely true. So a lot of my work is taking the silenced or the whispers and trying to allow people to come from tax space. I am one of the main, um, I suppose, um, as, as a range of a group called Tom Tarry, which is a traveling carry kind of a specifics only space, which we create creatively songs, poems, incredible insults. Um, so on each generation, you know, on each generation, intergenerational level, that isn't for, we're going to communicate to you, we, we're not going to teach you about us, we're going to share our culture with you, so we're going to stand each other better. We're just going to enjoy it. Mm. And we're going to salve it now. We're going to just wash it in these wonderful sound expressions just for us. And it's something that's very new for the community because if you think about travelers, there's three things they often ask people to ask themselves. And it's very difficult when you think about it. And you're not going to get an immediate response. But the first is, what do you know about us culturally? What do you actually know? Mm -hmm. so, and really kind of sit with that and go, actually, what do I actually know about this culture? The second is, what's the source of that information? Mm. Either they had it uh, since I, uh, I heard it from a set of normative kind of view, it was a research paper, I had a single kind of experience of this per person once, a neighbor told me. And the third, do you go through continual review and checking out that information to make sure that it's not unconscious bias, that's realistic, and it's grounded in the fact that we are as wonderful and as terrible and boring as everybody else, because we're human. Mm. You know, and so, we, so even those questions with, with, the, with the wider community talk about our language and our identity. We're really even talking about kind of we're, we are people who have shared this island. We've always been here. We're, you know, we're, we're symbiotic to the, to the land, the history, and we're still at the stage of learning how to speak to each other through all those guys. So I think learning and expressing, celebrating language, is a wonderful tool just that embraces the diversity of it, but also is that the secrets and knowings that we don't always understand, but we don't need to. We don't need to. They can be beautiful on their own. And this I find in common in your stories. You know, the, the lack of judgment. I mean, this is, I think, one of the best, most powerful things that that creative arts in general bring us, yeah, because because in arts, I mean, I don't know, maybe some people here are some art critics or whatever, but generally speaking, for the non-artists, art is just there to be taken for what it is, right? It's not there to be given prizes, to be judged, to be put for seconds. Yeah, so well, that's your own business. That's you know, <laughs> for the for the for the business of making the arts, but for the community's sake, for the consumption of arts, for everybody else to find their identities mm. validated. Mm. You know, like in in UL, we have this portraits collection, and the arts office is trying to to revisit it. You know, because it's an incredibly homogeneous. <laughs> Uh, collection, you know, the portraits are not including very many non-white people, not, not including anybody on the LGBTQ plus or anything other than the kind of men, woman, majority men, white. Uh, so, so th that those pieces are, uh, have such a power also in terms of kind of validating your identity without judgment, because you're, you're neither right nor wrong. And what I also hear from you. So no judgment is one thing, and, and celebration is another. And I wonder if I could skip and go to Tanisha <laughs> about the celebration, because he, she, you know, just over there outside, you were talking about this amazing project, but I'm assuming that's just one of many in, in 40 years, about uh, the Irish language and Sanskrit yeah. uh, having, uh, actually having, um, being part from the same family of, of languages. And how do you want to talk about it? Because yeah, I learn yeah. more as a <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, now I am not too sure whether many people know about that. That India's first ever language was Sanskrit. So all our scriptures and everything is written in Sanskrit language, and it is the biggest, oldest. So they say is I have done no research on it. Um, and uh, it is one of the spoken language. From there, there has been so many other languages. The Latin came, and apparently our lovely Irish language 
also came out of Sanskrit language. And this island here, uh, not as much north, but south of Ireland has got so many historical language, uh, religious connections, and uh, not just the missionaries going to India and doing all those sort of things, but also using art and also our religion as Hindu religion and the Irish Catholic religion together. So we celebrated and we did a research and that was Shiva meets Maeve. Now, I don't know whether you know much about it as well. So Shiva is the, uh, Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is the preserver and Shiva is the destroyer. And that's the death, you know, so that's it. So that's the end and Maeve is just basically a beautiful birth, rebirth. So that was the connection. And there is places here in Ireland, in County Kildare and uh, Wexford and further down, where they have the prominence of these two cultures, Shiva meets Maeve. And I did a beautiful uh, booklet and also uh, the whole research on it NVTV, our local television, uh, Merlin Heinemann sadly passed away in COVID and she did all that research for us and we did a fantastic exhibition and then that became a touring exhibition. In those days we had Peace 1 money, Peace 2 money and Peace 3 money and Peace and Reconciliation work could have been done no other way than bringing language in between and bringing them into culturally um, peace process and it was absolutely brilliant way of bringing not only just the two cultures together but also giving the importance of our past history plus the use of the language which is also diminished in India. Not many people now converse and in my childhood I was made to learn Sanskrit, you know, I, it was compulsory for me to learn Sanskrit, but not anymore. It is your, you have choices, you know, whether you want to go and learn. Sometimes they don't even learn their mother tongue, which is Hindi, you know, and that is also now the prominent language in India. But I feel that Irish here is also not spoken everywhere, which should be that it should be the language which is spoken first and then it comes the uh, the layers come after because that is our mother tongue um, but let's not go there we cannot change the policies and the procedures and the upcoming young people we just cannot but i just feel that these are the type of projects which should be brought alive again and also given the importance um, that how interculturalism just doesn't work with India and Ireland, how interculturalism has worked with having, you know, a beautiful Iranian people who are coming to this uh, island and the language they speak is Farsi. And once they start to speak Farsi, I'm arguing with them uh, and I says, no, this is Hindi. You know, you are you stealing my language, you know, and says, no, no, this is our word. I say, no, and then Arabic. If you look mm -hmm. at the Arabic language, it is so similar to some of the Hindi language words, Irish language, so similar. And um, so it is really, really, so in my organization, I don't say that you have to speak in English. There are people who speak um, Hindi, like me, and Punjabi, and I have other employees who will speak those two languages. And sometimes we go in our tangent and we speak our, we have an Irish speaking, girl who goes into Irish speaking and then we have Ulster Scots and she starts to speak in Ulster Scots and the mishmash of everything is just so beautiful and especially on Tuesdays and on Thursdays when we have all our refugee and asylum ladies coming and then men coming on Thursdays to do their English class is just so beautiful to see that the shared space we have created and there is no language barrier. You know, you just speak in your own language, whether I understand what they're saying or not, doesn't matter. 
It's the facial expression, their hand movements, their eye sort of moving here and there. And that is more than enough for us to sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when I come to my grandchildren, my, um, I taught my own language to my children. And like your uh, daughter, what you were saying, they were not very proud to speak Hindi language in school environment or anything like that. But now my granddaughters, they are so proud mm -hmm. that they want to learn Hindi language and go and speak Hindi language within their own school environment. And they might be the only Hindi speakers in their whole classroom, but they are not shy. But that is today's children, you know, and my generation was different. My children's generation was different and my grandchildren's day. Now, they, I know that this is something very new to them. They feel very excited by speaking uh, Hindi as, as a language on Saturdays when they are in my house or in their school, but they will grow out of it when they don't hear, when they, their ch school kids will start to tease them or something like that, then they will probably not want to. But I think we need to keep our cultures alive mm -hmm. and to keep the cultures alive, it is very important to celebrate through the medium of uh, languages and give everybody the opportunities to say what they want to say, whichever way they want to say. And I think you're and you're, not abuse yeah, the language. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so not abusive language. You're, yeah. you're touching on a, on a, on the right thing because um, again, you know, we tend to equate many things. So language with culture, culture with country, mm -hmm. country with maybe sometimes continent because you know Africans. I mean, what do you mean? Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that this is where again creative arts and multiculturalism mm -hmm. as an idea is much more powerful than maybe just saying nationalities. You know, well, we have so many nationalities, therefore we have to speak so many languages. Well, yeah, but actually you could be from Romania and you could be a Hungarian Catholic guy, right? Because we have a, a, a big Hungarian, well, you know, I mean, if I was a true, true Romanian, I wouldn't really say that because you know, they have their own country to go to. And Transylvania is ours. You know where Dracula comes from? Dracula is Romanian, not Hungarian. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> written by an Irishman. Written by an Irishman. Very good clarification. Okay. So again, like again, I think those are the important things. And when you are working in a say a host country, right? And when you are working with multiple minority groups as well as indigenous uh, and, and native groups, right? I think that you, you can get rid of all this citizenship criteria, you know, mm -hmm. and you have a chance, of a no judgment zone, where you can just speak the language, right? Or you can just think in your own language and create in, in, in non-verbal non, non, non uh, kind of ways, right? And what I also like about what you just said is that, you know, communication, and you, you kind of all touched about that, and uh, actually all of you, even, even you also mm -hmm. touched about that, yeah, <laughs> about the fact that, you know, sometimes you don't even have to understand, yeah. mm -hmm. because you're just there, and, and you're just, you just know, or what you said, Francesca, you know, the parents just relax, that they don't have to try to speak the perfect English, or they don't have to try to pretend, right? So I think creating, an, in, in psychological language, we would call that a safe space. Mm -hmm. And safe spaces are absolutely crucial mm -hmm. for many things. First of all, for, for just general mental health. Um, safe spaces are even more crucial for people who have experienced trauma of any sort, mm -hmm. of any kind. Safe spaces are really needed for learning to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't learn. Imagine a kid trying to do the homework while the parents are fighting. Yeah, good luck with the homework. You know, that's not a safe space. That's not where you can actually concentrate and, and, and be the best you can be. So, so I think that the, this fascinates me, you know, about how, you know, there are norms in society. There's a, a predominant language, for example, or a predominant culture, and how hard we then have to try mm -hmm. to create these other safe spaces where we, we can promote the other languages or the other cultures. And I think there's no better person to speak about this <laughs> than Anna here, who's doing with, because, it, because the, the Gelta, right? I mean, the, the, whole, the whole revival, bring, bringing back um, the growth of, of the Irish language, the original Irish language of this land after, after colonialism, you know, it, it's, a, it's a battle almost that 
it's only still at the beginning. At least I look, you know, if you look about history, thousands of years, you know, what's a hundred years. So, so what what is your feeling about that? Are people starting to to celebrate, to have these safe spaces, or how can policies, schools create those safe spaces where the Irish language is the language uh, that at least the people who speak it, <coughs> who who come from places like yourself, you know, who are your native speaker. Mm -hmm don't have to justify themselves or mm -hmm. don't have to, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I suppose there's a few things there. Um, the first thing I would say, um, just in, in relation to languages generally, but I think if we were asked to sort of define our position on languages a little bit, and mine would be, we have an expression in the Irish language, and Gwil means um, a relative or a connection, and means looking for the connection. Mm -hmm. And it's something that Irish people indulge in a lot, especially if you're from a country area where I remember my granny, who's probably younger than I am now, but she, she lost her sight uh, when, when she was in her 50s. And she used to sit, she was, so I grew up in Ironmore Island and she was from the mainland, and she was always talking about a cousin of X who's married to a second cousin of Y, and their daughter uh, is married to such and such. And my mother used to say, Mommy, they don't know who you're talking about because we didn't because the, these were, you know, a sea across from us and, uh, you know, a number of miles after that. Um, but it's actually something, and, and not too long ago I was reminded of that because I was at a, 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 a gathering before Christmas where a lot of diplomats were present and a lady walked in who joined our group and um, she was from a country where it's actually a little bit rude to ask where you're from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, some countries that is the case and and I kind of have forgotten and I know the language of that country and I, I shouldn't have forgotten and I but she, she actually wasn't from that country she was American she had a, she obviously was a native speaker from the from North America so I said you're American and she's well actually I'm Canadian <laughs> and the other person said no well I meant American North American anywhere and she said but we moved around I grew up in Canada but we moved around and there was another Irish person present and he said I think in, in the country you're from, I'm not going to say in case she's recognised or could be recognised, <laughs> that that people actually um, don't like to be asked where they're from. And I kind of thought about it, I thought, well, he's put me in my box there. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I thought, no, in Ireland, we always ask people where they're from. And it's not because we think that it's an insult or because we were being rude. It's because we're looking for the connection with them. Mm -hmm. And people used to say to me, oh, Irish people are very nosy, they're very curious. And, you know, they wanted to know where I was from and who I was married to and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's, not about, it's not about being nosy. It's looking to see who we have in common. And I, I know certainly, you know, as somebody who's lived abroad, um, if there are English people present sometimes when you meet another Irish person, this has happened to me on more than one occasion where the English person will say, I'll give you five minutes to find somebody you know in common. <laughs> and we always do. And because it's like, where did you go to college? Okay, oh, did you know? And, we, and then you find. So for me, language is about that. It's about, mm. it's about looking for the connection with the other person. And um, Nisha here talked about the connection between Irish and Sanskrit. So uh, Irish is an Indo-European language. Sanskrit is also the, the oldest written form of an Indo-European language, so there is a connection there. Um, in Europe, um, the uh, closest language to um, Sanskrit are, are, um, is Lithuanian, which is a, a called a conservative language because it has preserved many of the qualities of Sanskrit. Um, and Irish is actually the oldest uh, written language in Europe, which is still spoken as a vernacular everyday language. Mm -hmm. So so that's something that a lot of people don't know. So we have a very ancient language, which people still speak as a native language uh, to this very day. And um, when Owen was talking about secret languages and so on, I think we have a very narrow view of what languages are in that you know, a language is this, is that, should do this, should do that, should be this, should be that. Whereas languages have many, many different functions. And, you know, a secret language may be, is, is one of them. A, 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 a lingua franca 
which the English language has become, which the Spanish language is, uh, is, is another one. Um, but but because because your language doesn't do everything that you think, for instance, the English language does, does not mean it's less valuable mm. as a language mm. or less important as a language. And I think that that's something, sometimes we're very hard on ourselves in Irish because you say, okay, I wouldn't be able to discuss rock science um, in Irish, uh, even though the terminology is probably there somewhere. Um, I couldn't discuss rocket science in English either, in fact. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's uh, it, you know, I, I, I know from talking to colleagues, for instance, from, from Egypt, I, I remember talking to um, a colleague from Cambridge who, 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 who's, who's Egyptian and so is her husband, and he's a doctor, and she said, I said, oh, and he trained in Egypt, and did he have difficulty acquiring um, the terminology in English uh, when he came to England? And she said, no, because they're the only medical faculties in Egypt teach through the medium of English. So actually, he'd learned all his medicine in English. Um, so, 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 and sometimes then we think, oh, in Irish, I don't know the word for, you know, appendicitis, or I don't know the word for something. That's that's totally a natural phenomenon. Um, so, uh, you know, Irish is minority language and minoritized language. I think is a term that I pre prefer because. Because you know languages sometimes disappear um, accidentally, but more often it's a result as a very deliberate act on the part of a government, a state, uh, an ethnic group, or or whatever. Um, and uh, in today's world, it's you know English as a lingua franca is a huge thing. But we, I mean, we you know we have issues in Ireland to do with Irish, but we also have issues in Irish to do with the learning of foreign languages. Um, in that. Um, increasingly, for instance, in the European Commission, they're finding it difficult to recruit Irish candidates who can speak, who are proficient in several languages. Mm -hmm. Even though the Irish language is now, since 2007, recognised as a, a, full, a fully working and official language of the European Union. So, uh, when I was young, for instance, if I had wanted to be a translator, I couldn't have included the Irish language in my portfolio of languages. That's now possible. Um, so, so we're actually relying, we're going to be relying on many of our new Irish to represent us, to be our representatives in the, in the European Commission, uh, where two or three or four languages are necessary uh, in order to, to get a foothold, to get a foot in the door, and then you can move between departments and so on. Because we're not able to provide the people uh, um, uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, and I just, and I don't want to take to speak for too long, I came to, to live in Dublin in 1994 and at the time when I was in town, I, I used to really appreciate the fact of hearing another language. I was in town yesterday and I hardly, I hardly heard any English and I consider that a mark of great progress. Oh wow, yeah. fabulous. Mm -hmm. I have that experience in Brussels all the time, I don't mm -hmm. know where I am. Uh, <laughs> especially if you go by the around the European Parliament and I actually it, this reminded me that I, I think it was only a few years ago that the highest points in the living search in the Irish language were won by an Afro-Irish kid yeah. mm -hmm. right which I think mm -hmm. is so I don't beautiful know the highest points, but very, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that yeah, I, I think yeah. it's a few years ago I, I the uh, maybe even five years ago yeah. because and if people are bilingual it's much easier, easier. to mm -hmm. learn a third fourth a fifth language mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not easy, but it's easier. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, it's, it goes back to all the kind of um, brain, uh, you know, the brain yeah. is very uh, <laughs> interconnected mm -hmm. and the more languages you speak, the more connections there are there. Yeah. So there is a lot of evidence that multiling multilingualism creates more cognitive flexibility. But that is actually not even in um, just in, in learning other languages. They discover that people who speak more languages are actually more artistically creative, right? So they, they would combine, you know, they say, okay, yeah. color this house, you know, and then they color half the house in one color, half the house in another <laughs> color, or they just use more colors, you know, and they don't they do not do things. By the way, these are actual studies. I don't make this up, but, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can think whatever you like, you know, but I can follow up. I just wonder, I know, I know, and I'm very conscious that uh, all of you came here to also create and co-create and participate and, and um, Mother Tongues here has created that uh, plan for the workshop and for even more discussions to be around the tables. But I really want to give one more chance uh, to all the panelists to maybe give us a take-home message. Uh, okay, and, and look, I mean, you have many choices here. So you can make a take-home message about 
what you even like most about multilingualism. That's one one way to take this take home message. Another one is what you like most in working and being creative in general, whether you're creative through the arts or whether you're creative in other ways. And another aspect, maybe just going back to Francesca's point, is about that community building. You know, is there is there are there take home messages from all your experiences of working for so many years with different communities? You know, into how you know what is it that brings people together really? And also because I hear sometimes you know, you don't even know what they're talking about. You know, because it's still fun to be together. Is it just that you have to make people have fun? Like, is that what brings people together? And um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, because it's puzzling, you know, on the mm -hmm. one hand, we say it's good to learn and speak multiple languages. On the other hand, we say, well, there's body language, so never mind that, right? So mm -hmm. there are many ways to, uh, and, and, and Anna, I, think I really appreciate your comment about, you know, maybe we just have to really expand this understanding of what language is and, and give more credibility to the things that are just not written, mm -hmm. but very much active, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, be mindful of stereotyping, mm. you know, that I am Indian, so it doesn't mean that I have come from a very sort of poor background and I didn't speak English in my own country mm. or I can't speak any other language or cannot be integrated into the community. So I think that is very, and what we wear doesn't make any difference, you know, so we are all the same people and same, uh, you know, so I think just stereotyping is very, you know, let's be mindful of it. And uh, I think we can make this place a very happy place because we're not that bad, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we do welcome everybody, but there are these stereotyping things which go on to our heads and minds. And I think that's something which we need to step back mm -hmm. from um, and make this island the most beautiful island. You know, I, I think that's what will be my dream come true. Not just the green island, the emerald island, oh, the multicolor. Multicolor, multi yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and thank you. green, that maybe will come in between us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Take home? Uh, come on, no, no. give us something, give us something. <laughs> I think when we, when we speak, because we, we had a bit brief chat beforehand, and one of the things that came up a lot in our conversations, the word trade through it, the sense of um, people who were either newer, or kind of historically establishing themselves as the island, their families, and the sense of the idea of like, associated shame or embarrassment of languages, mm -hmm. and how that can be very complicated. And, but I'm a little bit more hopeful. I think that anything that is loved survives. Oh, yeah. Let me write that down. No, but we've seen it itself, like with, with the, the Gaelic mm -hmm. Gathering, like going, my father is a heathen in his 70s, and his father and his mother were Irish speakers. They're Toher, we call them, so they spent a lot of their time in Galway, and that kind of, that was their nomadic kind of circle, a circle to the Midlands, back to Galway. And when he was growing up, even then, and like, I mean, his family had been very strongly embraced Scan and Cantor language, there was association of Irish being something of the poor people, that it was to the poverty, this thing that was kind of like, oh, you don't really want to say it, it indicates all this negative thing about you. And we've turned it mm. into something, a sense of this, Celebration and beauty and mm -hmm. a richness mm -hmm. to it, and I, I and mm -hmm. the fact that, that can happen, it can happen to any language. And I think they want something is celebrated and embraced, regardless of, of the noise around us. If we do that ourselves, that gives us far more power. But I do, I know that sounds like a little friction thing, but I think it that is love does survive. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to love our languages and love the forms of them and love how they, they seep out. Because a lot of like our, we don't have a script to the style of our language. It means our language isn't written. Like by, by our hand, so there's all things with the Latin text, the Irish, you know, all this kind of nonsense. Mm. A lot of our language is with personal <laughs> referrals, so the stuff you can't say without looking at me because it's gestures. So mm. the thing that people ah. say to me, when I do, for instance, like in our community, pointing at people is not considered rude. Why it is within the majority, you know, you know, it's like, are you I point people? all the time, I don't yeah. even care. And, uh, yeah. So, like, when I'm talking about certain things, I literally have to point to it because yeah. uh, some of the connective words aren't there, so you have to go. <laughs> you know, you know Nicrel, which is a bottle, you look on, you know, rather than saying Nicrel, it could be any of these, you know, so you have to go up that one. Oh. Um, you know, but so I think that if we have the, if we have the, the pride and even the audacity, you mm. know, to embrace who we are and the languages that flow from us and meet us and greet us and that we want to dance it, I think that Ireland will be all the better for us, and even ourselves as we do. So dance the language, Francesca, that's the next thing, next year festival, dance the language. Thank yeah. you. I love it. Um, I'm just going to comment on the idea of building the community through the arts. I think 
what I found really inspiring in, in every work I do, whoever I'm working with, is that it doesn't matter where you come from or what language you speak, we all have shared experiences. And it's that moment, for example, um, in my work when a woman stood up and said, I'm going to share a lullaby that my mom used to sing to me and I'm singing to my daughter. And she sang it in Polish. I don't understand, but then it reminded me of my experience of my mom singing to me. And I'm sure like most of you now would think, oh, my mom, did my mom sing to me? Did she not sing to me? So then <laughs> the, using the art and music to create a shared experience that we've all had, or maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Did you get your mom to sing to you? We saw it like, on the TV anyway. <laughs> No, but you know what I mean? We all create a shared experience through music and the art. And when you create that shared experience, that could be a starting point. Mm. That Because then we all know how it feels to sing. We all know, I hope, that how my mom sings to me, that kind of feeling. And then that's the shared experience that we start building our community on. Because when you walk in the door from all sorts of life, there's nothing common between us. How are we going to start to build this? Then when we establish that there is a commonality, we have experienced this together, and even just being in the space together mm -hmm. is a shared experience that people can talk about after. Yes. Oh, I like that song. Oh, I did not like that. Oh, I did. Oh, the biscuits today were bad. And then suddenly you've got a shared experience to start building your community on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. I I was listening to we we are working with the Ukrainian communities now, and again the language is a barrier, or it's a problem because it's either Russian or or you know we have more Russian speakers than Ukrainian speakers, and then of course the Ukrainians don't really like it and whatever, but some speak it and so on and. So we were talking to a psychologist who does interventions, you know, and, and they said that actually she was in, based in the Czech Republic, and then they said that they just draw. They don't talk. They don't talk at all, you know, because they because it is exactly this being in the same space, you know, and, and exactly also the whole thing, like, she'd say, you know, what do you draw? I mean, I, I'm not good at drawing, you know, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And it's like, you don't have to be good at drawing, just draw some stuff, because now we move to triangles, right? So it can be so totally like devoid of the void of the typical judgments mm -hmm. or meanings that you don't have to be a portrait or something like this. And it's just the activity itself that actually helps the, the, mm. these, these refugee people to mm. just be in the space and not have to think, talk, analyze, relate, mm. and so on. And, and she, she said exactly, she had the same conclusion as you, Hala, that mm. it's just that sharedness and mm. that experience, that mm. now they have that in common and they have a bunch of scribbles, mm. really, because mm. it's not, you know, it's not art, but it is an art intervention. You know? But can I say that, I don't know, if because English is my second language, and when I'm tired, I can't speak English. True. Do you know, also, like, when I'm angry, I swear. Yeah, yeah. Many you, other you languages. switch to your language because, like, <laughs> your your brain brain is so tired to think in a different language. But can I can I speak Arabic? Yeah. And sometimes I have to say the sentence in Arabic and then translate it to, yes. to, to English. I'm like, okay, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So, take home messages on this side of the table. Yeah, well, I, I mean, language is about communication, essentially, um, and, and, and for me, communication is about finding the com commonality, if you like, between of experience between yourself and the other person, the people you're talking to, um, and it's about, um, yeah, looking at our common human experience and, 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 and um, how, how we view that. And I suppose what I love about different languages is the kind of little additional sort of richness that it brings to your life as well. And, and, and also that it opens up a new world to mm -hmm. you because, because I suppose um, one of the things that, that, that I regret that has been happening over the last number of years is, is the, the, um, the increase in power of, of, of English, for instance, as, as a lingua franca. And so the Erasmus programme that some of you might be aware of is an exchange programme between citizens of the European Union, mainly students. Um, that started in the 1980s. And um, we're now at the stage where when, for instance, English speaking students such as Irish students go to France or Germany or Poland or anywhere, mm -hmm. they end up speaking English mm -hmm. when they go abroad instead of actually immersing mm -hmm. themselves in the full experience of living in a country like Poland or like France or like Spain. 
And, uh, you know, one of my, my daughters went to on her Erasmus year to Clermont-Ferrand, and I, I, and, and I mean, she would have been exposed to French quite a lot. And I remember saying, uh, but you, and are you speaking French all the time? And she said, well, no, because, you know, if a German comes up to you and says something to you in, Engl in perfect English, it's very difficult to respond in sort of ropey French, um, uh, which, which, which you, I, I, I can understand. And, and then you find universities um, on the continent of Europe are offering courses for Erasmus students through the medium of English. It's, it's, it's started in Sweden and it's spread down, even down as far as Spain now at this stage. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're an English speaker, it's very difficult to learn another language. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, you have to be very stubborn and very determined. And, and, and uh, you know, I, 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 the same daughter lived in Berlin for four years and we went to visit her at one stage. And um, she said it's impossible to learn German. She was doing 15 hours of German a week. And um, people were still answering her in English in the shops. And I said, well, by God, they're not going to answer me in English. And so you go into a cafe and they'd say, English Deutsch. I said, Deutsch bitte. <laughs> <laughs> and then you discover you're speaking to an Australian in German after about three minutes, uh, the person serving the table. So, 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 I mean, I think we have to be understanding of English speakers as well, and that even those who try very hard, they have to try even harder than, mm -hmm. than speakers learning other languages. Mm -hmm. So, so I suppose that's 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 something that we're we're all aware of, but it's not st it's still not an excuse. Mm -hmm. um, it just means it makes our job a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Well, with people like you there, we won't have a chance. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm concluding. Fight the stereotypes. Yeah. Don't go by the stereotypes. What love survives. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> if you love it, it will survive, right? So um, I think that's really important to, to, to think about what is it that we love so much about our languages and about our cultures that we really cherish and love so much that we cannot let it go, right? And, and just trust that that will work that way. Identifying and creating shared experiences. Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly powerful and again, Sometimes it's with and beyond languages, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's uh, uh, incredible. And, and this last point about how the richness and the, the new mind, literally new brains and new worlds that the new language brings to you, comes very close to me because I was teaching about emotions and things like this. And, and um, you know, in English you say, I am sad. Mm -hmm. And apparently in the Irish language you say, sadness is upon me somehow. So that actually, psychologically, is a much better way to deal with emotions because emotions are there to come and go. So they are upon you right now, but they'll be upon him next. So they are not really there to identify. Okay, not the sadness, yeah, 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 all the other yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But but um, so so again, you know, when you speak another language, you you really learn to think and feel differently as well. And whichever language you choose to swear in or love in, that's fine as well. But at least you have more choices, mm -hmm. right? And I think that um, this this kind of uh, message of the richness. Uh, and sometimes they try what you put in to yeah. get rich. But, but also that no language is 100% pure. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the notion of that, that all of the languages probably in this room are present in some way, for instance, even in the Irish language. So, for instance, the word for, the word, there are two words for a table. One is tabla, which is, it, so from the Latin, in fact, originally. Uh, uh, the other word that's used elsewhere is board, which is from Scandinavian languages. Wow brought to us by the Vikings. So, so even, you know, even basic everyday words, uh, we have the word ishke, which is water, which has given us the word ishkebaha, which has given us the word whiskey uh, in, 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 in English. Um, you have the word um, slew, slew, a slew of people. You sometimes the Americans use it a lot. That's slew, it's from Irish, slew, the crowd. So, so, so that, yeah, and there, there, there is something in the medieval texts uh, in Irish, early Irish, where they talk about um, uh, uh, one of the Irish heroes going off to look for a language for us, uh, mm -hmm. for, for Ireland. And um, he ends up in a place that's, in the way it's described, sounds like the Tower of Babel. And so what he, d he does is he looks at all of the languages spoken there and he picks the best from each of them and he combines them. Nice. And then that's the Irish language. <laughs> so, so, so that that all of the languages that you represent, you know, mm. they have had an, an effect uh, in some way on our language, and we all have an effect and an, uh, um, uh, I suppose some kind of an impact on 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 the other languages that surround us. 
So it's all about communication. It's all about connection. Mm. Um, and 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 that Irish people. I, I did. I'm sorry. I don't need to, no, to take the floor. But but I I did a piece of research in 2005, 2006 when when sort of migration to Ireland was really just in its early stages. And I came up at the time with it, it was on the number of languages spoken in Ireland. And I came up with 167, and it was taken up by the Irish Times and by the media and everything at the time. And the overwhelming response to it was positive. 99.999% of people were delighted that so many so many languages were spoken in Ireland. And I was getting I was getting um, calls from artists who want, who were doing pieces of art and who wanted to know what the ten most popular were and all kinds of other things. And then I forgot about the Greeks, and I got a call from the Greek embassy um, to say, why did you leave the Greeks out? And I, I, it was just an error, and, and so on. But, but, but I think because of studying Irish at school, and that the, the experience is not always a positive one for everybody, but at least people are aware of the existence of other languages and other ways of being and other ways of expressing yourselves. So that you shouldn't forget that. And it's very important mm. to keep up the language with your children. Very good. And on that point, actually, this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, and uh, I would like to, first of all, thank all the panelists. So you will you join me? In the thank you, Francesca and, and the, the team, Ifa, for, for putting us all together. Um, and the next round, uh, probably after we just uh, shake up a bit and, and so on, it's, a, it's a workshops at each table. We're going to discuss about multiculturalism in the community. What are the challenges, but never mind the challenges, what are the solutions? So each table will have a scribe, you know, somebody to keep notes. So please think about that. So how do we promote multilingualism in societies? Okay, what are, what are the, the, the blocks and then how, how to overcome those blocks? So I'll pass it on to Ifa maybe to describe more, is it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.